Recently, there was a documentary series called Quiet on Set released about the dark world of Nickelodeon sitcoms. One of the revelations in particular involved the conduct of a producer by the name of Brian Peck. It was quickly discovered that Peck was a pen pal of the 1970s serial killer John Wayne Gacy. This has very little to do with the rest of this video, apart from the fact that it's topical and resulted in the search down the rabbit hole that we're about to go on. This is not a cheerful video, and for obvious reasons, consider yourself to have been warned. Hey, hey, hold on, uh, why are we talking about John Wayne Gacy all of a sudden? I thought this was going to be about the guy from the last time, like the eyebrow guy, um, Michael Aquino. <sighs> because I need to give a bunch of background information and I need to involve like a bunch of characters in this and like so I can dramatically tie them in later. Like, hush. Between the years of 1973 and 1978, a Chicago man by the name of John Wayne Gacy proved the stereotypes about clowns to be correct by becoming, up to that point, the most prolific serial killer in American history, immediately beating the previous record held by the Houston mass murders. However, uh, Gacy was something of an outlier amongst serial killers. While serial killers uh, typically tend to be antisocial or asocial, drifters, um, uneducated or poorly educated, aggressive, and frequently unemployed or underemployed, Gacy was widely loved by his community, um, due in part to performing as a clown on holidays and at, you know, birthday parties. Uh, he was civic-minded, um, he was a college graduate, you know, somewhat passive, uh, successful. He was, you know, a manager of several KFC franchises in Iowa. Uh, later, he owned a small business uh, running a company in Chicago called PDM Contractors. Um, Gacy was also a very active member of an organization known as the Junior Chamber of Commerce, or the JCs. This was a leadership and politics organization targeted at young professionals to facilitate networking and honing political skills. Famous JC's alumni include Bill Clinton, uh, Richard Nixon, Ronald Reagan, uh, serial killer Edmund Kemper, and Bill Gates. The Chicago JC's chapter is known for having a strong connection to Chicago politics and the Chicago Democratic Party, of which Gacy was also involved, at least at an organizational level. However, this all goes to show you that you cannot trust clowns because he sexually assaulted, uh, sometimes tortured, and then killed about 33 young men and buried the majority of them in his crawlspace. Uh, in prison, after his arrest, he claimed uh, to not have operated alone and said that he had help with the logistics of the killings and that he had recorded videos of many of the murders for distribution. In addition, at least one of the murders took place while he was confirmed to have been out of town. Now, unsurprisingly, it's pretty hard to argue your way out of finding even one dead body in your crawl space, let alone more than 30. Um, so, the official stance on these murders is that Gacy acted alone with no accomplices. Uh, the good old lone wolf serial killer pornographer. Let's turn our attention now to Houston, Texas, and the mass murders of the same name. Between 1970 and 1973, at least 28 boys and young men were kidnapped, tortured, sexually assaulted, and murdered by this guy right here, Dean Coral. Coral was born in Indiana and moved between Indiana and Texas several times through his childhood and adolescence. In 1962, at the age of 22, he returned to Houston, where he would live for the remainder of his life. Uh, for the next uh, eight years, there's little to note of Coral's activities apart from reports of, you know, sexually inappropriate advances in behavior towards young male employees of his candy company. But in 1970, though, uh, Coral would crank up the dial on the murder meter with the aid of teenage accomplices Elmer Wayne Henley and David Owen Brooks. For every victim that they led to Coral's apartment, uh, Coral paid them $200, or about $1,600 adjusted for inflation. Uh, well, for $1,600, I can understand. When questioned by his accomplices, you know, like what the boys were for, Coral told them that he was part of a ring based out of Dallas that bought and sold boys, and trafficked in drugs and snuff films. Following this revelation, the reaction of Henley and Brooks was more or less like, you know, yeah, okay, whatever. Um, Coral also claimed to the pair that he wasn't doing the killing, he was just selling them to people to be killed. Which, I'll be honest, is kind of like a weird thing to lie about. It's not better. It's not an improvement, but... Before long, uh, Henley and Brooks began to assist with the murders themselves, too, which I guess is, isn't terribly surprising. Coral's killing spree uh, only came to an end after he was himself killed by Henley. Henley brought over two of his friends to Coral's apartment to hang out and smoke pot and drink beer and sniff paint, but wound up enraging Coral due to the fact that one of the friends he brought was a girl. Uh, Henley explained that his female friend just needed to get out of her house for the night because she was afraid of her drunk father, which seemed to calm Coral down a little bit. God damn, her dad must have been drunk to have it be preferable to have her be babysit by Dean Coral. But 
anyways, just to skip to the relevant bits, Henley wound up shooting Coral, confessing to be an accomplice to the murders, um, relaying what Coral had told him about the Dallas ring, etc. Uh, the police initially did not believe Henley about the other victims, though, and only wound up looking into what he was saying after he was able to recall the names of three missing Houston area boys. Now, Coral was posthumously charged with the murders of 28 people, although Brooks and Henley both insisted that there were more victims whose bodies hadn't been recovered. However, uh, the Houston Police Department wound up calling off the search for bodies uh, after the 26th and 27th bodies were found tied together. Uh, this is believed to be due to the fact that up until this point, the you know U.S. KDR record uh, was held by Juan Corona with a 25 to 1, and once that was, you know, once they'd beaten that, it's like, okay, fuck the rest of them. Um, this was highly criticized uh, due to the fact that no fewer than 42 boys and young men vanished from the Houston area between 1970 and 1973. Meanwhile in Dallas, on August 13th, 1973, only five days after Coral's death, police raided the apartment of a certain John Norman after receiving a tip about a possible homosexual prostitution ring. John Norman was at this point 46 and had already accumulated a pretty sizable pervert rap sheet, having been arrested in Houston for sexual assault in 1954, 1956, uh, 1960, in California for sexual assault in 1963, uh, and in 1970 was convicted on federal charges of distributing obscene material and sentenced to 15 months in prison. Following his release in 1971, he set up the Odyssey Foundation, the sex trafficking ring uh, for which he was being raided in media res. Following the raid on his apartment, police found photos and contact info for teenage boys along with catalogs intended for distribution to clients. These included photographs of the boys, uh, referred to in the literature and also hereafter in the video as fellows, uh, that you could pay to sponsor in exchange for two to three days of company. Additionally, uh, the Dallas police found a client list of his, consisting of a filing cabinet full of about 30,000 pink index cards, with between 50 and 100,000 names of clients along with their contact info and sexual preferences. Uh, these were then passed on to the State Department for further investigation. Oh, so they went on and like arrested all the clients sponsoring the fellas, right? Ha ha. Uh, no, of course not. They declared the index cards irrelevant to the investigation and then burned them. As a side note, in 1977, a Dallas police lieutenant named Harold Hancock testified that the client list included high-ranking government officials and prominent public figures and celebrities. So I guess they've just always been like that. As a result of the raid, uh, Norman was charged with possession of marijuana, contributing to the delinquency of a minor, and conspiracy to commit sodomy. He was then released on bail and immediately fled to the great state of Illinois, in particular Chicago. Now, it seems like I'm jumping around here, but bear with me. These, these threads connect. In 1975, there was an investigation undertaken in California into a potential distribution network for, um, how should I put this, uh, the worst type of film you can watch. 8mm starring Nicolas Cage? You know, yeah, close, alright, yeah, close enough. What wound up being uncovered by the bust included video taken of the torture and murder of at least 11 of the victims of Dean Coral, mixed in with an enormous array of photographs, film reels, film negatives, contact sheets, Polaroids, slides. Now, this isn't important, but there's something darkly funny about the concept of someone choosing to document a murder on slide film. Like, d so does that mean, like, the operation has a dark room and, like, a film development tech? Like, you can't take that to a lab. I told him, I told him, you got a meter for the blood, not for the skin. Now I gotta do this shit again, goddammit. Anyways, this adds quite a lot of credibility to Coral's claims of a Dallas-based operation dealing in human trafficking and distribution of snuff films. Back to Norman. After fleeing Dallas and moving to Chicago, he began living under a different name, Steve Gerwell, because it was the 70s and you used to just be able to do that. Following getting that sorted out, he immediately went and molested at least 10 teenage boys. By November, um, and keep in mind, he left in August, uh, late August, early September. So by November, uh, the cops were, you know, on the lookout following multiple reports of a Steve Gerwell moving in and starting to molest everyone around him. Now, on the 14th of November, uh, Norman was arrested and charged with five counts of indecent liberties with a child and eight counts of contributing to the delinquency of a minor and taken to Cook County Jail. From what I can find, a little more than two years later, he had his bail of $36,000 paid by someone in California and was released awaiting trial. 
Now I'm going to take the next two paragraphs from Wikipedia verbatim because, uh, like, they're accurate for once. In December 1976, he was sentenced to four years in prison and sent to Pontiac Correctional Center. Shortly before he was released on bail, Norman began his next sex operation, The Delta Project. Like from the name of the video. Uh, and began publishing a newsletter called Hermes. From Cook County Jail, Norman sent out three newsletters using the jail's printing press, uh, claiming the Delta Project aimed to provide educational, travel, and self-development opportunities for qualified young men of character and integrity, and that Delta dorms were being established across the U.S., with each dorm having two to four cadets overseen by a don. Uh, let me repeat that. He was publishing the Kid Sex newsletter and catalog from prison. Good God. Anyway, police alleged that the cadets were underage male prostitutes recruited in Chicago. Yeah, no shit. Um, in a May 1977 interview with the Tribune, uh, Norman denied that Project Delta was sexual in nature and claimed to have sent the newsletter to over 7,000 people. At the time of the interview, uh, police said the newsletter had 5,000 subscribers and grossed over $300,000 per year. That's a lot in 1970s money. And also, if it's not sexual, why are people buying a newsletter? You usually, like, have to unsubscribe from those. Like, you, people don't, you can't even give those away. Norman was paroled in the fall of 1977, but was arrested again in Chicago in June 1978 for having sex with two underage boys from a local foster home and taking pornographic pictures of both. One of the boys informed investigators that Norman was in the process of selling him to a client, and Norman was simply waiting for his plane ticket. Norman was accused of refounding the Delta Project, now called the Creative Corps and MC Publications. Um... Norman was accused of refounding the Delta Project, now called the Creative Corps and MC Publications, after being released from prison and operating it out of his apartment on West Wrightwood Avenue, allegedly sending photos of the oh fuck that scared me, um, allegedly sending photos of the boys to a dawn in Canada. In a raid of the apartment, twenty thousand more pink index cards, or possibly fifty to one hundred thousand, containing the names of customers, were found. In 1977, uh, while Norman was still imprisoned, uh, the victim who testified against Norman, uh, leading to his conviction, was stabbed to death while walking home. The primary person of interest in this murder uh, is the next moving part to come into play, a man by the name of Philip Paskey. Paskey was a career criminal and sex offender known for his proclivity towards violence. Um, he worked as the manager of MC Publications' mailing operation and took over the whole operation temporarily while Norman was in prison. Uh, Paskey was described as being Norman's closest associate and second-in-command. He was also described as being, you know, quite tall, with bad skin and a pockmarked face, as well as having a tendency to cross-dress. He also had a tendency to inexplicably not go to prison, despite a very long criminal record, with charges for things ranging from drug possession to assault, to illegal fireworks, to assault, to assault, to assault, to murder. It doesn't appear that he ever actually spent any time in prison. Even for the murder charge, which he successfully pled down to a robbery charge. He robbed him of his aliveness. He was only sentenced to five years probation, so yeah, that's kind of weird. Alright, uh, now back to our buddy Pennywise. Recall that John Wayne Gacy ran a contracting business called PDM Contractors. There are a couple of interesting names that pop up when you look into his employees. Number one, Michael Rossi. Rossi was an employee of his that was implicated in his testimony as a possible accomplice to the murders and who admitted to helping dig the trenches under his house used to bury the bodies. Rossi's maternal grandfather, however, was the famously or infamously mob-connected Chicago alderman Vito Mazzullo. Corruption? In Chicago politics? Given Gacy's strong ties to the Chicago Democratic Party, this is an interesting connection, given the possibility of mob involvement in distribution of content. Next up, let's look at another one of Gacy's employees, one Philip Paskey. Oh, from like a minute and 38 seconds ago. Yep, Philip Paskey was not only employed by PDM contractors, he also lived with Gacy, um, and was reportedly one of his closest friends. Additionally, according to witness testimony, uh, when together with Gacy, Paskey was the one calling the shots and seemed to be in charge. All right, now on to what you've been waiting for. The man of the hour, or at least the man of the previous video, Lieutenant Colonel Michael Aquino. I touched on the Franklin scandal a bit, but let's take a quick look at Johnny Gosh, a missing boy whose kidnapping was allegedly orchestrated by Michael Aquino. 
Paul Bonacci, who won a million dollar civil suit against Lawrence King, uh, pointed to Aquino as the supposed ringleader of the operation and eventually wound up meeting with Gosh's parents to provide them with information relating to the kidnapping of their son. Specifically relevant here is that one of the people involved with the actual kidnapping itself was a man by the name of Troy. Let's hear his description of Troy, according to the court testimony. Interesting. That rings a bit of a bell, Kira. Let's take a look at a composite police sketch of Troy from the investigation of a different kidnapping in which he was believed to have taken part, and that Bonacci immediately and very confidently picked out of a lineup. Huh. Looks like Philip Paskey. Oh, from like a minute and 38 seconds ago. Okay, let's move on to the last and, quite frankly, weirdest piece of the puzzle. We have an explanation for how Gacy may have been connected to the mob. We have an explanation for Ga how Gacy was connected to Norman. We have proof that Gacy was connected to Paskey, proof that Coral was connected to Norman. But is there any connection that Norman had to the Dallas mob? Well, let's take a look at one of Norman's rental properties and see if there's any notable Dallas mobsters who lived there. God damn it! Yeah, that Jack Ruby. Turns out, Jack Ruby was a pretty well-known Dallas area mobster, having connections to both the Dallas and Chicago mob, uh, owning a nightclub and having a reputation for being able to put people in contact with those who can supply what they wanted, whether it be drugs or fellows. All right, so where was John Norman at the time of this? Oh, Dallas, I guess that makes sense. Well, let's see, uh, did Ruby make any notable trips uh, near the end of 1962? Oh, Houston, awesome. Um, when did Coral move there? Oh, of course, a couple months earlier in 1962. Side note, he also made a stop through New Orleans on the way, which is repeatedly referenced in the Paskey FOIA files as being mentioned in the same breath as Chicago, Dallas, and Houston in regards to this trafficking ring, but I don't really know what the deal is with that. I'm, I'm still looking into that. All right, so this gets into the area of just conjecture at this point, but I wonder if there's anything notable that Jack Ruby did that he would prefer to go to jail for and be known for. Um, and not talk about ever, as compared to going to jail for some other things that he did and being known for those things. It seems like a pretty good way to ensure that someone sticks to the story if you just find someone where the reality of what they actually did was notably less popular. So, what happened to the various involved parties? Uh, where are they now? Well, Gacy was arrested in 1978 and executed by Lethal and Jackson in 1994. Dean Coral was killed at the scene of his crimes. Coral's accomplices, Brooks and Henley, were given life sentences. Jack Ruby went on to do something unrelated and then got hit with the cancer ray before he had a chance to testify. Uh, John Norman would continue to keep distributing the same sort of material throughout the 80s uh, before being arrested again in 1987. In 1999, the state of California declared Norman a sexually violent predator and committed him to a Tascadero State Hospital with a statement from his psychiatrist saying, John is an unrepentant adult male sex offender who, in my opinion, will go to his grave without any remorse for what he had done. He remained at Atascadero until 2008, when he was released. Uh, now, what he did next might shock you. Um, he was released and immediately went and started trying to download illegal pornography and posted a classified ad seeking a young male roommate for companionship and sex and got caught passing a sexually inappropriate note to a young-looking male grocery store clerk. Following this, he was recommitted to Coalinga State Hospital, where he died two years later. Philip Paskey never saw the inside of a prison cell and died in Chicago in 1998 with little known about the circumstances. Anyways, um, I don't really know where to go from here other than that this is a weird, sad, fucked up story um, that... Like and subscribe.